Well, good morning and Boker Tov. Welcome back to Mishkan Katan. I was uh, a little bit behind this morning and uh, I was just typing a message on my Facebook page to let people know we were here. You know, this is a, a, a an unusual week at MessianicLamRadio.com because several of our content producers like myself are taking the week off um, so uh, I'm one of the few that's broadcasting live this week, and I'll tell you more about that in just a minute. I just want to give people um, a heads up that I'm here on Facebook. So if you'll indulge me, I'll do that and then we'll continue. All right. Um, now, um, thank you for letting me do that. I should have done that before the broadcast started. I know I always sound a little bit nasal. At least I sound that way in my head. But last week, I came down with the Voldemort of viruses, if you can uh, put your own interpretation on that. So I've been fighting that since last Wednesday. Last Wednesday, I was out of state and taking a wonderful trip. At least it was wonderful until about Wednesday night when I got hit with this. And uh, so did my husband. So we limped home and we've been trying to recover ever since. <laughs> so uh, if I don't sound like myself today, I hope I won't be low energy, but um if I don't sound like myself, that's a little bit why. Okay, so thank you for your forbearance with that today. And I think everything is going as it should. I've got comments up here, so I can see comments if you post any comments this morning. All right, so guess what? We are finishing the Book of Ruth today. And what a wonderful journey it has been with you. As I have previously announced, I hope next week to begin the study of the book of Esther with you. But before that, we must finish Ruth. So we'll get to that. But first, I want to make a couple of corrections. Last week, I mispronounced the pseudonym of the nearest kinsman. In scripture, in Hebrew, it is Ploni Almoni. That's the correct pronunciation. I said it that way some of the time, and other of the time I think I may have said Aloni Plomoni, or who knows what I said, some crazy stuff. So uh, it's Ploni Almoni, and I had to write it down on a, where did I put that? On a piece of paper. <laughs> So I would be sure and say it right today. I have a, 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 first of all, okay. I have a name dyslexia problem. I don't care what name it is, whose name it is. I have issues with remembering names and getting them right. It's, it's just a dyslexia to me. It, don't take it personally. You may tell me your name is Bob Smith and I will forget it 30 seconds later. It's just a challenge. So that doesn't surprise me that I messed up the name. Another thing that I got wrong last week that I, I, I want to tell you about is one of the intricacies of Hebrew. There are two words in Hebrew which are pronounced like this, shalach. One is spelled sheen, lamed, kate. That word shalach means to walk. It's a verb which means, uh, I don't mean to walk, excuse me, that's halach. Shalach means to send in the pa'al, in the um, in the P-E-P-A-L form, it means to um, thrust out or to uh, put out, send forth. Um, but in the pa'al, it just means to send. Okay. Now, there's a homonym to shalach, which is pronounced shalach. <laughs> and however, it is spelled sheen lamed kaf, kaf. 
And it means throw. It means to throw. It is a he feel verb. So even though they sound the same, they the last letter is different. And then there's the word which we found in chapter four, verse seven, which is shalaf. Shalaf. Hear the F sound on the end. The final letter of that word, whole word being sheen lamed pay, but there's no there's no degesh inside the letter to make it a P sound. So it's an F sound. So it's shalaf. And what that means is to remove. And it's in that verse where it talks about the nearer kinsman removed his shoe. Or as I mentioned last week, some believe that it was Boaz who removed his shoe. And you can refer back to the deeper intricacies of that teaching if you want to go back last week and review that. I'm not going to plow that row over, but I told you the word was shalach through, but it isn't. And a lot of theologians make that mistake because they don't understand the Hebrew because those last letters of all three of those words look very similar, not to mention the homonym factor. So enough of that. I've made my apologies and made my corrections. And so let's go. All right, we are in verse 13 of Ruth chapter 4, and I'm not going to be reading to you in Hebrew the verses today because I just was not able in my preparation to get that done, and uh, because of my physical limitations, we're just not going to hear it in Hebrew today, so please give me your forbearance with that. Verse 13, however, in English so Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Now, this verse comes right after verse 12, verses 11 and 12, where we see that Boaz married Ruth, and I want you to notice the order here. Verse 13 is the strongest argument that I believe exists in Scripture, for Boaz and Ruth behaving themselves on the threshing floor that night. Boaz, being a leader in uh, his tribe of Judah, did things decently and in order, as the Presbyterians are fond of saying. Verse 13 states outright that Boaz did not have relations with Ruth until after he had purchased her. It's also clear in this verse that it was Almighty God who allowed Ruth, according to the sages who was 40 years old at the time, to conceive by a man who, again, according to the sages, was 80. Ruth's conception of a baby stands in stark contrast to those 10 years that she was married to Mahlon, a much, much younger man, and during all of that time, she did not conceive. We need to remember that verse which says, children are a heritage from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Psalm 127.3. I have a business associate who is so far to this point been infertile, and I pray for the Lord's favor on her. Her name is Elisheva. If you wouldn't mind praying for her, she's about 41. So uh, she's getting near the end of her time, but the Lord is good. He gave a baby to Sarah. He gave a baby to Ruth. Both of those ladies were in their 40s. As I've looked back through my ancestry, I have many ancestors who bore children into their 40s. So he is the giver of life. Hallelujah. Now with this verse, verse 13, interestingly enough, Ruth's name is not mentioned again in this book that bears her name. However, the sages maintain that she enjoyed unusual longevity, long enough to see 
her royal descendants, David, and even Solomon, ascend to the throne. Isn't that amazing? That's unusual longevity. Wow. Another point I want to make about this is that if you add the compiled numerical value of the words of the letters in the word conception here in this verse, you'll get 271. If you add the value of the letters He, Ra, Yod, and Nun, you'll get 271. And that's the number of days which, according to the sages, a pregnant woman carries her child. Now, some of the commentators point out that at the end of verse 13, Boaz isn't mentioned. That is, it doesn't say she bore to him a son. No, instead it says, and she bore a son. This is because, again, according to the sages, Boaz died on the wedding night or, right, or immediately after. Now, I want to change trajectories for just a moment, and I want to highlight some of the parallels that the Bible commentators have made between Boaz and Mashiach Yeshua, Messiah Jesus, and Ruth and his bride, the church. First of all, what is a type in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament? Well, what is a typological study for that matter? Sounds very dry and boring, doesn't it? And I'm going to drill down some today, so I hope you've got your drillers your your drillers equipment on okay so we're gonna we're gonna go deep today so it's not gonna be dry and boring I hope but we are gonna get into some of the depths of the scripture all right so a type as far as the Tanakh is concerned is a person or a place or an institution that predicts or prefigures another person, place, or institution that is to come. And we see this a lot in scripture. A type corresponds to and also harkens forward to its future counterpart. We read in Romans 15 verse 4 that the apostle Shaul, Paul, said, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So if you want more hope, dig for it. Dig for it in the scriptures. To put it in common English, we're going to look for a moment at the parallels between Boaz and Yeshua, Jesus, how Boaz's actions prefigured what Jesus would eventually do. And there are at least seven connections. The first connection is that both of them were from the tribe of Yehuda, the tribe of Judah. And secondly, both of them called their hometown Bethlehem. Now, if that were all there was to it, there'd be a lot of people who could fulfill those two things, wouldn't there be? Yes, there would. But third, as we've seen in our study, Boaz was a kinsman redeemer, and so was Yeshua. So he is. Boaz and Noomi were kinsmen and kinswoman, their relation being through Noomi's husband, Elimelech, her dead husband. Elimelech, remember, was Boaz's uncle. Yeshua wrapped himself in flesh to come and dwell among us, to tabernacle among us. We're coming up on the season of the Feast of Tabernacles. Hallelujah. He chose to pitch his tent among us. Boaz redeemed the family of Elimelech by purchasing Ruth, 
when she was an outsider, when both of Elimelech's natural born sons were dead, when Ruth was getting old, if you didn't want to say old, when things looked so hopeless for the family line of Naomi. It was a miracle, really, the story of Ruth. And many people thought that they were a cursed family. Have you ever felt like you came from a bad family? Well, there are no perfect families, first of all. But you may have felt weighed down during your life by something that you had no control over. something that you more or less inherited. And I, I, want, to, I want to ask you to, to sort of think about that a little bit as we continue on through our lesson today, because that question holds the key as to why we have the story of Ruth in our Bibles at all. And I didn't really fully understand this until I was preparing this lesson but it's a beautiful, beautiful nugget. I'm eager to share it with you. So think about that. If you've ever felt like, well, I am limited by my family background. My family's a bunch of cocoa nuts, okay? <laughs> you know that expression, I'm cuckoo for cocoa nuts. <laughs> no, it's cocoa puffs, isn't it? Or whatever it is. We'll talk about that more in just a minute. All right. So this story of Ruth and Boaz, it, it's really a miracle. And in a similar fashion as humanity, we were out of options to redeem ourselves. We, we had no more helplines. Okay. Adam, the first Adam had blown it. He had blown it. He and Hava. Eve, Adam and Chava, they had blown it. But then the incarnation, the great God, our God, wrapped himself in flesh in the form of his son. And he came to tabernacle among us. And he purchased us as Boaz purchased Ruth. Similarly, Yeshua purchased us with what? With his own blood, the most precious commodity he had, that divine blood that brought us into his family. So number three is a big one. Whoo, kinsman redeemer. Hallelujah. Fourth, Boaz took a bride from the nations. And likewise, much of today's bride of Christ, Jesus, is Gentile. Although more native-born Jews are coming into the family as we approach the end of days. And in the very end, during Daniel's 70th week, many, many more will come in. They will recognize their Mashiach. And they will flood in like a great flood. And it will be glorious to witness. Fifth, they were similar in how kind they were. Now, Christians, I will tell you that Jews, observant Jews, place a tremendously high value on kindness. Kindness is highly prized probably more so by observant Jews than by Christians. I, I, that's a bold statement. But I've had more experience with Christians, and I can tell you a lot of us are not kind. Okay, there, there are times when I choose bluntness over kindness, and that's not godly. Ask my mother. Hello, mother. <laughs> so kindness, chesed, loving kindness we ought to always be kind in our interactions with one another. Throughout our story, Boaz was unfailingly kind to Ruth. Even when he first met her, 
he was unfailingly kind. And by extension, he was kind to Naomi. And in his days on earth, Yeshua was so incredibly kind. Often we read in the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, of his kindnesses extended not to the high and mighty, but to the lowest of the low. To those others would not even associate with. To Zacchaeus, the tax collector. To Matthew, whom he called to be a disciple, although Matthew was of the despised occupation of tax collector. Wow. So, loving kindness, loving kindness. And it cost Jesus something to heal these people. You remember the story of the lady with the issue of blood? Her faith was so great that she understood in her heart by the Spirit of God that if she only could touch his seat seat, if I could only touch the hem of his garment. Now, as Christians, we don't understand what that means. But his garment would have been his talit, because all Jewish men, that was their outer garment, their talit. And on the edges of his talit would have been his tzitzit, the fringe, representing the 613 commandments of the Torah. And that's what she did. She touched his tzitzit. And what did Jesus say? He stopped and he said, who touched me? Who touched me? Because when he healed, he could feel the power going out from him. Now, as I've been recovering from the Voldemort of viruses these past few days, any little thing that I did, I could feel the power going out from me. <laughs> Not healing power, but you know how when you're when you have a debilitating virus, you just, you know, like yesterday, I, I, I ran and put letters in the post office box. I didn't literally run. I drove to the post office and I put letters in the post office box. And when I got home, I laid down and I took a three hour nap. I could feel the power had gone out from me. So it was not without cost that our Mashiach did these healings. Chesed, the Hebrew word for loving kindness. And six, number six, they had integrity, which extended beyond the requirements of the law. Boaz not only kept the law, he exceeded the law. He was just a merciful, whereas the law focused heavily on justice. Okay, justice was done. Our job is done here. Justice was done. We stoned the adulterer. We stoned the adulteress. Justice was done. Jesus did likewise. He not only kept the law of Moses, he said not one jot or one tittle shall pass. He said in Matthew 5, 18, until all have been fulfilled and he often said things like, you have heard it said, and he's referring to heard it said either in the Torah or in the Talmud, which was oral law at the time. It hadn't actually been written, but it was the oral law. We call it the Talmud today. You have heard it said, but I say unto you, he not only kept the Torah he fulfilled it. He went beyond it with mercy. Mercy. And seventh, Boaz and Yeshua were similarly generous in their dealings with others. In fact, Yeshua was so generous with his blessings that 
Some people thought it was scandalous. You may recall in Boaz's case that after the night on the threshing floor, Boaz sent Ruth away with a huge amount of barley, around 35 pounds, what we might call a dowry, a down payment. Likewise, Yeshua gave his spirit, his Holy Spirit, 50 days after his resurrection at what Christians call Pentecost, but what is more properly called Shavuot in the names of God's biblical festivals. The Holy Spirit was given on Shavuot. What a generous gift, his own spirit to live within us, our own dowry. The Holy Spirit is our dowry as the bride of Christ. And he lives within us and he works and he moves within us. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And finally, as Boaz was a gentleman on the threshing floor with Ruth, the ultimate generous act of this story, Yeshua, likewise, does not force himself on us either. If people want to reject him in their lives, he lets them go right ahead. I have a friend, a young woman of the age to be my daughter. I've known her since she was five years old. Our friendship gets strained, though, in the area of religious beliefs. Our belief sets are not compatible. And when I begin to talk about mine, she gets highly offended. I'm at the point where I'd better not mention anything about Yeshua or about the Trinity because she believes in a God of her own choosing. And he is not the God of the Bible. She specifically, she resents the exclusivity, the jealousy of the God of the Bible. Since she buys into that satanic lie that there are many paths to God. A belief statement which stands in stark opposition to what Yeshua said, that he is the only way. He is the only truth. He is the only life, John 14, 6. And so all I can do is continue to be her friend, continue to love on her, and pray for the eyes of her heart to be enlightened. All right, we're moving on to verses 14 and 15, which say, Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a redeemer, without a goel. May his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Amen. It's very interesting to me that Obeyed, the baby, is viewed as a redeemer in this story. But that is because by his birth, he redeemed Elimelech and Naomi's family line from distinction. I'm sorry, <laughs> S extinction. By saying that by prophesying that Obed would be famous in Israel, the women were prophesying, they were affirming that Ruth had been accepted as a full-fledged Jew due to her conversion, with Obed being considered likewise a full-fledged Jew. Now, this is very important, as, as you'll see later on. Keep that in mind. The phrase restorer of life here also carries with it the meaning refreshes the soul because Obed's birth, in a sense, resurrected the soul of her dead son, Machlon. Now, not literally, of course, but his birth 
resurrected Mahlon's family line. May all of us who have sons have daughters-in-law who are better to us than seven sons. What a promise. You have, And you have no idea how precious a prayer that is to me. But where did the reference to seven sons come from? You have uh, that movie, um, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. <laughs> Has nothing to do with that. It's hard to say where the reference to seven sons came from, but some scholars believe it's a reference to the seven sons of Jesse. And you're probably like, hmm? I just love that commercial where um, they have this German shepherd, I think it is, and um, they're, it's about dog food, right? And, and they're talking about the ingredients of the dog food. And so they go over the ingredients of the inferior dog food and the German shepherd goes, hmm? <laughs> it's one of my favorites. Anyway, why the seven sons of Jesse? Why bring those dudes up? What is the point? Okay, you're going to find out soon. So there's a good reason why the scholars believe this could refer to the seven sons of Jesse. Keep in mind, the author of the book of Ruth, who is it? Do you remember? Samuel, Samuel, the prophet, Samuel, the last judge. It's likely that he wrote this story after the anointing of David to be king of Israel. Hmm. Now, since Samuel anointed David and since Samuel wrote this book, here is that nugget that I told you we were going to get to. Samuel, without a doubt, knew the seven sons of Jesse. He looked at each one of them individually as he went down the line until he came to David. These seven sons are mentioned in 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 13. Why would he have mentioned them? All right, I'll come back to that in just a minute. Another thought is that this reference goes to verses 18 through 21 of chapter 4, because between Peretz in verse 18 and Obed in verse 21, there are seven sons or seven generations. Just a couple of thoughts. Verses 16 and 17. I know I left you with a hanging chad. I know, I know. I'll come back and pick it up. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, quote, a son has been born to Naomi, end quote. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, this sounds a little weird, but some of the commentators say that Naomi supernaturally was given the ability to nurse Obed. And Naomi at this time was, gosh, she had to be close to 80, if not in her early 80s. And I'm telling you, that would be a miracle of the highest order. Of course, God can do anything he wants. But some of the commentators say this. I... And that this is why the women in verse 17 said, a son is born to Naomi. Now, the verses don't seem to be claiming that Naomi birthed Obed, of course, but that she in some way nursed him. Okay, maybe not with paps, but she nursed him somehow, right? Laid him on her lap, kept him all the time, helped, helped Ruth, you know, as we say in the South, she brought him up. Okay. But if Boaz 
did die immediately after the wedding night, then Naomi would certainly have helped Ruth raise Obed, certainly. But what is this emphasis on calling Obed Naomi's son? What's, what's that all about? Obviously, he was born to Ruth and nursed by Naomi, a collaborative effort of raising. Obviously, he was Boaz's son. Well, consider this. It would be as if the Rockefeller line or another famous American family line ended and suddenly a baby was born by legitimate means from one of the daughters-in-law. Now, you'd have to the, the American family would have to, I guess, subscribe to liberate marriage or something, but let's just say this happened, okay? The emphasis would have been placed on the baby's father's lineage because of the fame of the family. And that's what's happening here. In this case, Elimelech and Boaz shared the same ancestor in Nashon, the son of Amenadab, a prince of the tribe of Judah. Judah. The sages credit uh, Nashon with being the first one to plunge into the Red Sea at the crossing over at the Avar, the crossing over from Egypt. So in a sense, the family line with the greatest cred, credentials, was applied to the baby Obed by the women. And his name is Rem remarkably like the Hebrew word obeyed, which means to serve. So the naming of the baby Obed or obeyed by the women was a blessing that indicated that obeyed would grow up to serve God, Hashem, with his whole heart, serve Father Yahweh with his whole heart. The scuttlebutt among theologians is that Obed's grandson, King David, and here's, the, here's that hanging chad for you. The scuttlebutt among theologians is that Obed's grandson, King David, was harassed by certain ones in the house of Israel because of his unworthy, unsavory family lineage. Remember my question several minutes ago? Have you ever felt that your family background held you back? <clears throat> Maybe your mother had you illegitimately. Maybe you don't even know who your father is. Maybe your father went to jail. Maybe your mother is currently in jail. Maybe someone in your immediate family committed a murder. There are all kinds of ways we can mess up our families with sin. And maybe you feel held back by that. Well, you know what? I'm going to tell you something. King David felt the same way. Yes, the great King David, the same David who God said was a man after his own heart. Yeah, he felt the same way. He was chased and plagued by feelings of unworthiness because of two things. Number one, he was the youngest of the seven sons. There were six other dudes who more rightfully should have been anointed king before him. He was the baby. The baby. And secondly, his grandmother was a Moabitess. And his great-grandmother 
was a pagan from Jericho. So he was plagued very likely by people who would say, wait a minute, he's not worthy to be king. He's descended from a Moabitess. Now, of course, these people were ignorant. But are you beginning to see now why Samuel might have written the book of Ruth? After David was anointed king? And don't be tempted to think, oh, well, he just made this up. Samuel just made, up, made this story up to sanitize David's reputation. Really? Come on now. Do you really think the God of heaven and earth would allow a work of fiction into his holy scriptures just because? Well, no, I don't think so. And please tell me you don't think so either. My googly moogly. No. The story of Ruth is in no way fiction. It is in there for many reasons, not the least of which is to teach us that no matter what our roots, no matter where we come from, whether savory or unsavory, we have an equal opportunity to grasp what God has for us to take hold of it and to make the most of it. And if you don't subscribe to that, if you make excuses for why you're not doing that, well, you're going to have to answer to someone higher than me. Okay. And I put myself in that category. I better be making the most of what I've been given also which is why I'm here with you today, as well as the Voldemort virus, okay? Sitting up here, conquering that demonic thing in the name of Yeshua, by the power of his blood, hallelujah. All right, gang. You see, a man-made story would have sanitized David's lineage entirely. There would have been no mention of a Moabitess named Ruth or a dude named Elimelech who ran out on his people to, to a pagan country and refused to come back. There would have been no mention. A man-made story would have attributed David's birth to an aristocratic, well-born Israelite mother, a woman of the caliber of the illustrious Nashon ben Aminadab. It was only through the will of God that the true narrative was able to be told and preserved for all generations as he Father Yahweh had his spirit prevail upon the prophet Samuel to write down the truth in the book of Ruth. And why does that matter? Because in this story, David doesn't get the glory. God gets the glory. Verses 18 through 22, as we round third and head for home. We're going to finish a little bit uh, shy of what I had planned today, I'm afraid. In other words, I've bitten off more than I can chew, but we'll see if we how close we get to the end. Now, verse 18. These are the toldot, the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, 
Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Yese, and Yese followed, fathered David. The book of Ruth is not the only biblical book, of course, containing a genealogy, but it's the only one with a genealogy at the end. And again, truly, the genealogy is a clue to why the book was written and why the story was shared. Now, I promised a while back that we would delve into the mystery of Perez. So we're going to get to that now. As I previously taught, Perez was the firstborn of twin sons to Tamar, and they were fathered by Judah, one of the sons of Jacob a brother to Yosef, Joseph. After establishing King David's lineage from Boaz to Ruth, Samuel then goes back into Boaz's lineage to the patriarch Judah. Well, almost back to Judah, to his son Peretz. Anyway, there's a mystery surrounding Peretz because the verse that contains his name in this genealogy, in that verse, there is a Hebrew letter with special characteristics. That letter is the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. No, I'm sorry, the 22nd letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's the Vav, and its numerical value is six. Now, wait a minute. That is not right. Vav is, wait, I know I wrote it down wrong. One, two, three, four, five. It's the sixth letter. I was right the first time. The sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, okay, and its numerical value is also six. The Vav is written in the shape of a tent peg. Envision a lowercase l, lowercase l, with a short horizontal handle attached to the top. Looks kind of like a like, like this. I can't make my finger look like it. You know what? I am going to draw you a picture of a bob. That's what it looks like. Okay. So you can see why it's sometimes nicknamed a tent pit, right? <clears throat> when we see the bob in the Hebrew scriptures, it's often used and translated as the English word and because and in the English is a connecting word and Vav is a connector. Its actual Hebrew meaning is hook or connecting hook. Okay. We first see this letter in Genesis 1 1 where the Vav is used to connect heaven and earth. Genesis 1.1 says, Bereshit bara Elohim eight hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. In other words, the vav implies connection between the earthly and the spiritual. And in the Bible, six is the number of man. Now, how is that? Well, man was created on the sixth day of the week. Man works for six days and rests on the seventh. There will be six completed millennia of time before Mashiach returns to earth to set up his earthly kingdom. And finally, Revelation 13, 18 identifies the beast, the false Messiah, as having the number of a man. Six, six, six. So I ask you, what man would be able to connect heaven and earth? Only one, the God-man, the Mashiach Yeshua, the Lord Jesus. Here we see him in Genesis 1, the unbroken Vav. Now, in Exodus 27, 9 through 10, we see the word vav referring to the hooks, specifically the silver hooks that anchored the curtain, the yariah, that enclosed the tabernacle, the mishkan. 
to its posts, also called Amudim. The posts were called Amudim, and the curtain was the Yeriah. And I'm mentioning these words to you for a specific reason, because the scribes who wrote out the first Torah scrolls decided to construct them in a way that would mimic the Mishkan, the tabernacle. Each page of text was called and is still called today a Yeriah. Each column was called and is still called today an Amud. And each Amud begins with a connecting hook, with a Vav. A kosher Torah scroll is very, very expensive. Thousands of dollars. Why? Because there are over 4,000 rules for handwriting one. The complete scroll must contain exactly 304,805 letters placed exactly into 248 Amudim. But let's get back to this idea of the Bav. Leaving Exodus 27, where we learn about the connecting hooks of the tabernacle, the next passage we want to examine is Numbers 25, 12. Remember that those over 4,000 rules for copying a kosher Torah scroll, one of them is that none of those letters, 304,805 of them, none of them can be malformed, broken, or otherwise illegible. However, in Numbers 25, 12, we see a broken bob. Now, what does that mean? A bob whose stem is broken. Well, instead of this, it looks like this. Like a compound fracture. It's broken. The broken vav occurs in the word peace, shalom, shalom. The story in Numbers 25, verse 12, is of Phineas, a courageous Israelite who is actually the grandson of Aharon, Aaron, the high priest, Aaron, the other same Aaron high priest who was the brother of Moses, Moshe. The people of Israel at this time were sinning greatly. In fact, this story in verse 12 centers around an Israelite man who is having sexual intercourse with a Moabite woman. And in his holy anger and zeal to address this egregious example of the sinning of his people, he committed a sacrificial act that assuaged the anger of God against his people. He killed this couple. He impaled them both in the act. And God's anger was assuaged. So the word shalom in verse 12 contains a broken vav. The shalom with the broken vav can represent a man of peace who is broken for the atonement of Israel. In the case of Phineas, after he did what he did, the plagues which were afflicting the people of Israel stopped. Can you think of another man of peace who was broken for the atonement not only of Israel, but of the whole world? Yes, Phineas foreshadowed the Mashiach, Yeshua, the Sar Shalom Yisrael, the Prince of Shalom, the Prince of Peace, who was broken to attain our redemption and our atonement. That Vav in Genesis 1-1, he's presented as broken in, the, in Numbers 25-12. <clears throat> All right, I'm getting rather far afield here in this Vavness, and I have less than five minutes. But what about Perez? Do we see a broken verse, a broken Vav in this verse, Ruth 4-18, that speaks of parents. No, we do not. 
To fully understand what we do see in conjunction with the Vav, we must look at Genesis 2, 4, where we find the Hebrew word toldot, generations, spelled with two Vavs. Yes, in Genesis 2, 4, <coughs> pardon me, I actually sound great today, believe me. In Genesis 2, 4, we find that word spelled with two Vavs. One after the first letter and one just before the last letter. However, after the fall of man, after the first Adam did his thing, dooming spiritually all of us, the word toldot, generations, is spelt defectively with only one vav. The vav that appears just before the last letter. The first Vav went missing in that word until, guess when? You got it. Ruth 4.18, where in the word toldot there, we once again see two Vavs. In all of scripture, there are only two places where the word generations toldot is spelled with two Vavs, with the correct spelling. It's Genesis 2.4 just before the fall of man, and in Ruth 4.18. What do the commentators say this means? Why was the Vav restored in Ruth 4.18? Well, the name Peretz means to breach, to bridge the gap, or to break through. Just as the first Vav seemingly was lost, in the generations after the fall of Adam, so it was restored through the descendants of Peretz, one of whom was King David and another, the greater king, the king of kings, our Mashiach, Yeshua. It was through the obedience of the second Adam, prefigured by Phineas, the second Adam, our Mashiach, Yeshua, who breached the gates of hell and death on our behalf. It was through his obedience that we are restored to our God. In closing, a few additional thoughts about the genealogy. Hezbron was mentioned in Genesis 46, 12 as the firstborn of Peretz. Ram was Hezron's son, but Ram was not the firstborn. The firstborn, Jeramiel, was disqualified from this honorable family line, ironically because he married a Canaanite woman. Aminadab, the firstborn of Ram, was one of the greatest personalities of the tribe of Judah during their Egyptian bondage. Amenadab's daughter, Elisheva, was the wife of Aharon, the high priest, according to Exodus 6.23. And we've already studied about Nashon, Salmon, Elimelech, Tov, and the rest. So, quite a famous family, huh? Quite a famous family. Well, thank you again for coming along with me on this study of Ruth. It's been such a joy, and I hope that you've learned something. I've certainly learned things. Yes, absolutely. I've learned a great deal. I want to thank Hebrew for Christians website who, who taught me in this book. Also, this book that I got from Art Scroll, which was very informative, and uh, some other websites which I consulted along the way. And until next time, we're almost out of time. Shalom, shalom, and may you have a blessed Holy Week, a somber and meaningful fast. We will see you in Sukkot.